Support Wrestle Talk. Give us a subscribe. It's the Wrestle Talk Pay Per View of the Year Award Show for 2022. I am Luke Owen D A D. I'm joined by Chopper P Quinnell. I'm joined by Tempest. Blackpool Content Club, everyone, mm, yeah. as we are here on the Wrestle Talk podcast channel to count down the 10 best pay per views of 2022 or premium live events. According to us here at Wrestle Talk, mm. our editors, our website writers, our $100 Patreon backers, and wrestling influencers have all submitted their nominations. They submit to me their top five shows of the year. Your top five, your fifth, your best show gets five points. Your second best show gets four points. Third gets three, et cetera, et cetera. I have totaled up all of those nominations to officially reveal the best shows of 2022. I'm excited. Me too. I am excited as well because I think it has been, it is, we, so we were having you know a lot of conversations about our nominations in the office and things like that. And I think one of the best things I can say about the year in 2022 has been, everyone really struggled with the worst match and worst pay-per-view nominations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also at the same time struggled with best because it was like, I actually don't know what I'm going to pick here between these ones. Like worst, it was hard to think of them. Like Ollie said to me, he's like, I can't think of five bad shows this year. But when it came to the best ones, it really was like a, oh, I could, is it this one? Am I putting this one in? Like, where am I placing mm -hmm. this one? It's been quite a tight vote, uh, I would say, for best shows. Yeah. And I I can't wait to reveal that number one is obviously going to be uh, TLC from Monday Night War Season 2. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's the best pay-per-view of the year. <laughs> Mr. Higglesby versus <laughs> Jive Owens. Oh, if only. If only we could. So, uh, yeah, that's how the nominations work. And coming in, uh, the, the five that didn't make it into the top ten. Mm. So, Crown Jewel did not make it into the top ten. That got four points. Bound for Glory did mm -hmm. not make it into the top ten. That got five points. The Royal Rumble did not get into the top ten. That got seven points. Who <laughs> should not have been voted at all? Is picking the Royal Rumble this yeah. year. Three, pe Rumbles. three people voted for that, including one person who gave it four points. That uh, them show. right now. <laughs> who was show. it? Wrestle Kingdom 16 got eight points. Oh, boo. Should also point out as well uh, that double night shows were mm. only counted as one thing. So yes. like Wrestle Kingdom, WrestleMania, that is a one that is one show yep. rather than night one, night two. Uh, and double or nothing made it in at mm. number 11 with 12 points. In fact, getting five nominations, one of which was top level. Mm. So it very nearly made it in. Interesting. It was probably Ollie because Punk won the title. <laughs> 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 However, it was not enough to unseat Number 10, with 14 points, four nominations, including one top level, Triple A's Triple Mania. Was it Stephen yeah. Larson? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they certainly were of the three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah absolutely, yeah. So uh, I'm really pleased to see the Triple A got into the, the top yeah. 10 again mm -hmm. this year. They always do. Good for them. Good for them. The Kingo and Ray Phoenix oh, on yeah. this show had a legit match of the year contender. Like, everybody, of course, looks at it and goes, man, ah, the flippy stuff. Flippy, <laughs> flippy, flippy flips. <laughs> But if you want to take the Lucha Libre style and mix it with an intense, dramatic, blood-filled match, this is probably the best example of that this year, where you had Ray Phoenix's mask ripped and he's bleeding everywhere and Vikingo is being Vikingo, where he's doing just the most in insane, incredible moves that you'll see from anybody in wrestling, the most giveable wrestler not named Keith Lee. Oh, that match was like, just incredible. You talk about, as we did on our previous award show, perfect examples of a style of match. That was like a perfect Lucha Libre match. You want to talk about someone who like could get a really big platform in 2022 for Kingo. If Triple A just gets their head out of their ass and mm. makes it so you can put him on TV. <laughs> Make him streamable. It's it's almost kind of begs the question of like, you know, you've got a working relationship, like why isn't when like he on dynamite like mm -hmm. why isn't he like having a big showcase pay-per-view match because he getting that to a north american audience could be a huge game changer for him absolutely mm -hmm. if you just like it's not uh, it's obviously not going to be the triple a triple mania main event match that you'll get at triple mania but if you wanted to put ray phoenix versus vikingo on dynamite it would open so many people's eyes mm -hmm. to what there is out there that you just don't get to see that often. Absolutely. Uh, in at number nine, with 15 points across five nominations, WWE's Extreme Rules. Yeah. I have not seen this show. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, and for me, this is 
I think the Edge Balor match is a lot of that because it was super duper long, but also had like the big sports entertainment drama around the end of it. I'd also say Brawling Brutes Imperium yep. was awesome. Yeah, we actually I forgot to mention this on our best matches. Go and check that out. There's a link for that in the video description down below if you want to check out our matches of the year from 2022. Mm. Um you mentioned like Giovanni Vinci coming mm. back for the the Gunther Sheamus match at Clash of the Castle. One of my first thoughts, and I even said this to Adam on our live reactions, was like <gasps> trios matches, yeah, because like, <laughs> yeah. there's three brawling brutes and yeah. now there's three of the Imperium. Yeah, and I mean, of course, you can't talk about this pay per view without mentioning the return of Bray Absolutely. Wyatt. Absolutely, that being the biggest return of Triple H's reign. Yep. It was the thing that had been built up to. It was the element of Extreme Rules that had the most intrigue going into it. And then they paid it off with a really satisfying debut return, whatever you want to call it. I think even with... Some people like the Bray Wyatt stuff that has gone on since then, but even for people where it has kind of not been followed up on immediately or as impactfully as others might have liked it to have been, you still have that debut and that debut will be remembered as like the peak of that show. And one of the peaks of triple H's run thus far. Yeah. And people will, they won't talk a lot about the matches because you're right. Like I actually forgot the brawling brutes Imperium was on that match. I was struggling to think like what else in that show? Yeah. There was edge Balor. main event was the, the fight pit, which the triple H very much felt like he, that's trying to make him his new hell in a mm-hmm. cell. But like really like the matches were sort of like there and some of them were good. Some of them weren't that great. But that Bray Wyatt return mm-hmm. is, I mean, like WWE themselves kept promoting it's like, it's the greatest return of all time. Like mm-hmm. that is in their mind. They showed the entire thing again on Raw because there were going to be more people watching Raw than there were watching the pay-per-views because that's the way it always is. But they were like, no, let's just show the entire thing again. Because I really thought they were going to have Bray show up on Raw because it was the thing that everyone was talking about. And they didn't. Instead, they just showed the debut again or return again. And the second time around, I'm still like, chills. Like, Mm. it is an incredible return. And like you were saying, I don't know if the follow-up has been as great as the return was. I thought the Uncle Howdy reveal on SmackDown was a bit cringe. But you cannot take away how great of a return it was at Extreme Rules. Mm -hmm. It's something, again, it's like you were talking about in the best matches show that we did of WWE dangling that thing that you want in front of you. And it's like, we got this white rabbit thing. It's, it's Bray Wyatt, but we're not going to say that. It's just a white rabbit. It's the white rabbit tees, the white rabbit tees. And the fans were like, I think it's Bray Wyatt. I think it's Bray Wyatt. I think it's Bray Wyatt. And it comes to you go, yeah, it's Bray Wyatt. Here you go. Without being like, find out on Raw what it is. They didn't like take it away from us. They just gave us what we wanted and had the big return on the show. And a couple of the matches were real good. So it's a very worthwhile show. Just reminded me of all of the, the chatter about the white rabbit. People being mm-hmm. like, guys, it's carrying cross. <laughs> <laughs> so many people kept telling me it's like you're wrong, bro. It's carrying cross. Yeah. This whole thing in Luke's underground. I'm like, dude, it's it's probably Bray White. It's Bray White, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> In at number eight, 17 points across seven nominations, two of which were top level, Survivor Series 2022. The first Survivor Series, I would argue, in a a decade plus, maybe even longer than that, the legit had like a, oh, cool, Survivor Series is coming up because it had the war games stipulations added Mm -hmm. to it. I think that, I mean, Vince has been on record many, many times being like, I don't like Survivor Series. He wanted to kill that stipulation dead years and years and years ago because he'd felt that it had passed its prime. And that is kind of evident in a lot of recent Survivor Series where no effort has been put into it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. It's for brand supremacy or whatever that is. Under siege. Yeah, like, you know, and all this sort of stuff. And I, I think the first one they did, the first brand splits one was was good and then the nxt one was a happy accident because Mm. everyone got stuck in saudi arabia but this one was the first time i could i remember people being legit excited for survivor series Mm -hmm. yeah and i think the show really did pay off i thought the both of the war games matches were like okay i thought Mm -hmm. they were both totally fine but they they both achieved what they needed to do which is create highlight reels that you can show next year to hype people up for the war games matches so you don't have to rely on nxt footage you've now got main roster footage with main roster stars plus and we talked about this in the best matches final seven minutes of the men's war games match is probably the best final seven minutes of a wwe match this year yeah i think that goes a lot way Uh, that goes a long way because you look at the rest of the card and it's like there's some fun stuff on there Mm -hmm. like AJ Styles and Finn Balor have a match, and it's like it's it's a good match. Yep. Mm-hmm. You've got the the U.S. title 
three-way match with Seth Rollins, Austin Theory, and Bobby Lashley have a really fun match. Yep. You also, unfortunately, have Ronda and Shotzi. But it really is just the War Games matches and the intrigue going into it about the War Games matches that carries the show. And thankfully, you have that closing sequence of the men's War Games matches that everybody absolutely wet themselves over, us included, Mm -hmm. where it was one of the things where we had we had theorized about what they could do at war games and none of us not once none of us theorized that it ends with Jey Uso and Sami Zayn hugging and it felt like exactly what we've said where it's totally unpredictable we still will be happy with whatever direction they go and then they gave us one that we didn't predict and we were still happy with it mm-hmm. yeah the, the the last thing i want to say about that war games match is I, I like you. I don't like the fact that the the baby face had the advantage because I think it messed up the psychology of the match. Yeah. But Roman Reigns sat there like a mafia boss in his chair, just you know, ordering people to go mm-hmm. out was well cool. It was pretty good. It was real cool. Yeah. I, I thought you know, real cool there. I also say, as we've said many, 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 many times on uh, this channel in the past, it's how you leave them. Yeah. And this show left you going like, well, that was cool, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. uh, which just elevates the whole show to yeah. absolutely another level. In at number seven, with 23 points across eight nominations, AEW All Out. This did better than I was expecting it to. Mm-hmm. Because there was not... There's a lot of negativity around the show, not only from Brawl Out yeah. that, that came directly after this show, but also this was a long, long show with lots of matches. Like yeah. Ollie, I think, called this a bloated, a bloated pay-per-view card. And I I didn't watch this one live. Um, I and in fact I wasn't even working the next day. I watched it the day after. And I watched it in two chunks. Mm-hmm. And I think that actually helped my things. We talked about it on the behind the scenes review. I actually quite liked All Out. But I think it helped with the fact that I watched it in two chunks rather than watching yeah. the whole four odd hours that it was. Because I didn't feel the drag. Like when they, you know, Jericho, Danielson coming, you're like, Oof, there's still like four mm-hmm. matches left on this card. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't feel that drag because I I had the break in the middle. But I still think, you know, there are some great, great matches on this. I think the, the Elite Dark Order, I think, mm-hmm. is incredible great match i think the main event of moxley punk i thought was awesome Mm -hmm. jericho danielson i thought was really really great there is actually a lot on this card most city machine guns were on this card like it's not what i would have booked for them in their aew like (laughs) Mm -hmm. debut but hey i had fun with it regardless yeah yeah i think this is an interesting card looking back on as well i'm surprised that it makes it onto this list personally (coughs) not because it's a bad show Because honestly, I don't think AEW's had a bad pay-per-view to this point. I think even the ones that they do that are not the level of other ones that they've done are still good shows with Mm -hmm. good matches and lots of things to enjoy on them. And this one had, you know, Swerve in Our Glory against the Acclaim. Absolutely. And a good women's Mm four-way. And so many things to like about this show. But at the same time, there's also a lot of things where you look back on it in, in hindsight, almost immediate hindsight in some cases, and be like, well, what did we accomplish with any of this? Yeah. Because you had the CM Punk thing, of course. You get that world title stripped. You get the elite losing their their titles immediately. And honestly, one of the things that I've found most disappointing about this whole time period is because we were looking at all of this thinking, that's going to be when Daniel Garcia does his big turn. And not only was it not that, we never got that. And thus, a lot of this rivalry with Jericho Danielson, whatever, really does kind of feel very inconsequential. Mm-hmm. That being said, all of the matches that I just talked about were amazing. So if you're just going to watch a show in a vacuum, it's still a great show. I'd argue all oh, that's the genesis of Jamie Hayter. Like, I think that is yeah, really, for that, sure. that is, I think, the moment when this AEW crowd were like, that's our girl. Mm-hmm. Like, she should be champion. And like, were then mad that she was not the champion. Mm-hmm. I'd also say as well, I'm surprised that it made it on the list because a lot of people were upset with the casino ladder match. Oh, yeah. And yep. it ending the way it did. But I also think that the end of the show, once again, MJF being revealed and it's like, okay, we're getting MJF punk again. That's great. And it left people being like, 
Okay, cool. That's a nice ending to the show. Even though I didn't like this other thing that came earlier, it ends really well. And then, you know, there was the whole press conference yeah. thing, which wasn't great. Yeah. But I, I, I'm I, surprised that it's made it as high as it is. It's really surprising to me, honestly, because mm. you've got like a really lackluster Athena Jade Cargill match that goes mm. like four minutes. Powerhouse Hobbs and Ricky that Starks is like a five idea. minute match. Shouldn't have happened. Just yeah. nothing to it. And you had uh, like Christian and Jungle Boy was an angle instead of a match. Yep. And that was one of the matches I was most looking forward to. Yep. So there's a lot. There's like four matches on this show that I thought were fairly major disappointments. And yet still places this high. So I guess it just speaks and to the quality. Well as well. Like I, yeah. I thought that would have really like tarnished the show. I mean, as I said, like it, it got no top level nominations. Mm. Like looking at it, it was uh, a few fours and the rest of them were twos, basically mm. like twos and threes. So it was like a lot of middling to low yeah. on people's yeah. uh, nominations. I genuinely surprised to see it as high as it was mm. considering that double or nothing didn't make onto this. And I thought yeah. double or nothing was actually a better show. All yeah. Considered. Uh, in at number six with 34 points, 15 nominations, one top level. And I was surprised because on paper, this didn't look all that great, but it showed, this was Triple H's first show in charge, mm. SummerSlam. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us were like, you know, it was the first pay-per-view card that Triple H was given. And it was not a card that he booked, but he put his stamp on it by taking Seth and Riddle off the show because he was like, well, I'm going to do that at a different show anyway. And I don't want to just do it again in a couple of weeks time. And also, I think there was a reason why Matt couldn't be on the show regardless. But also he brought back Bailey, mm -hmm. re-signed Io Shirai, brought back yep. Dakota Kai. Like that opening match, the Becky Bianca match, A, was awesome. And then B, that real stamp of like, and this is what you can expect now for the next six months mm. of my hmm. TV and pay-per-views, by the way. It's bringing back NXT stars, people that were going to leave in the case of Io Shirai. So strap yourselves in. And considering how little interest there was in that Brock Roman match that was in the main event, it's amazing what a digger can do in terms of getting people to be like, actually, do you know what? Fair play. Yeah, it's all right. There was a forklift. Yeah, There you go. 10 out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, to me, again, a really good example of expectations for a show being low and mm -hmm. therefore kind of easily yeah, yeah. surpassable. Yeah. But those ones are often the ones like a WrestleMania 31, for example, mm. where you go into it with low expectations. And it would, that was bad. It would, it would have been well easy to just go into it and instead of being like a five out of five or five out of ten show, it ends up being a six out of ten show. And you go like, oh, this is pretty good. It's better than I expected. But this was a really good good fun show lots of stuff to enjoy lots of really memorable moments as well where you have the returns which is everybody's favorite part of wrestling this year it seems you get the returns of bailey and everybody to really make you feel like okay we're going in a new direction we're getting some fresh blood into the women's division into wwe in general and then capping it all off with a really fun strong main event that was the best version of roman reigns and brock lesnar since WrestleMania 31, at the very least, mm. there's a lot to enjoy on that show. And even if it isn't Triple H's vision, it is enough Triple H to give people things to be excited about going forward. I think a lot of us, because this was, you know, two weeks after Vince had retired, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of us going into this were expecting, all right, the Raw after, mm -hmm. that will be where we'll really start to see the, the Triple H stand on things. But no, he showed us it right at SummerSlam to be like, by the way, guys, this is what we're going to be getting. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably what got it into a lot of people's nominations. As I said, 15 nominations, only one of which was top level. So it was mm -hmm. on a lot of people's cards, but no one loved it enough to give it to the top, uh, top marks. And I think that's fair enough. In at number five, with 44 points, 12 nominations, but three of them were top level. AEW New Japan's Forbidden Door. A show that I think, again, is people, when it was announced, people had massive expectations for but then the build and the actual end card of it was like, eh, it's not what I would have booked for my first AEW New Japan Dream Card show. Mm -hmm. But actually, by the end of the show, I mean the three of us did the the live reactions for it, and it was a you know it was where Tempest show. Yeah, Tempest came here. Like yeah. he came to I the went UK. through the Forbidden Door. He did right. come through our Forbidden Door. You're welcome. <laughs> At the by the end of it, I was like. Ah, it was totally worth it. Like, I can't think of a bad match that was on the card. Like, every match that was on there really delivered. I had so much fun. The six man with ELP mm. and Sting, like, mm. I had a great time mm -hmm. with. Oh. 
The outside of the finish, the four way with mm-hmm. Akada, Cole, Page, and Jay White was awesome. Thought Moxley Tanahashi was great. Osprey Cassidy mm-hmm. was awesome. The F- Jericho Suzuki mm-hmm. yeah, deal. Absolutely. FTR winning the tag belts. Like there was a lot on this card. Cool. Atlantic belt. The as well. Oh, what yeah, a great Clark four. Connors way. having yeah. the performance of a lifetime. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, as the replacement for it. Yeah. And that's the other thing as well. There were so many names announced for this show that couldn't end up being on this show. Mm. Danielson, Ishii, like Takahashi. All of these names that were announced and went on the card. It felt like a cursed show. Yeah. So it's actually, it's impressive it was as good as it was because yeah. everything was going against it. Great wrestling. I think the the very, very end of this show is a valid criticism. It yep. was an angle for blood and guts. Yep, completely agree. Which don't, don't do that for your first Forbidden Door show. Uh, but the actual caliber of wrestling on this show was phenomenal. Yep. And I think that while a lot of people probably would have booked different matches in their dream fantasy booking scenario of AEW X New Japan... I think that the level of wrestling delivered on what people wanted. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the part that I, I'm never going to end up being surprised that all of these talented wrestlers produced <laughs> a very good show yeah. filled with very good matches. It's like you've so got... weird that Orange Cassidy and Will Ospreay had a good match. <laughs> it's so oh, bizarre that Claudio so... Cassignoli oh, and Zack Sabre Jr. Jr. had a Jr. very technically oh, good wrestling match. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was just sort of that perception of the show yeah. going into it that had people down on it. Because 100%. like you've still got Okada on the show. You've got Tanahashi on the show. ZSJ and Claudio on the show go down the entire list whether it's Suzuki, it's Kingston, it's Jericho. People on the pre-show were still great. It was Desperado and Kanemaru against Swerve in Our Glory. Like, what would be an incredible match was just like, you know, it was on the buy-in. So <laughs> it was to me a, still a very like good card, but it didn't fulfill what I had wanted That's out it. of the AEW New Japan crossover show. And the more I've thought about it, the more it is like, well, maybe it's unrealistic to want some things like that because this is like a cross promotional event and thus booking one guy's crew to beat the other guy's crew. And every single match, you look at even just the four way match where it, it, the ending falls apart because Adam Cole gets concussed and it's like, well, he's the guy who's going to eat the pin. Well, you, in the moment, you're just like, well, just change the finish. It's like, it's not as simple as that, is nope. it? Because you can't beat Okada. Just mm-hmm. You can't just switch the plan and have him beat Okada. Hangman Page is one of the top babyface stars of AEW. You can't just beat him. There's only one option at that point. And so when you're then trying to book a full card of like, here's this AEW guy beating this New Japan guy, or this New Japan guy beating this AEW guy, there's a lot of politics that would go into something like that. Mm-hmm. And well, I don't know how... Politics as well. Yeah, right? you've still got, like, Andrade couldn't be on the show, and that took out, like, stuff with Naito, and, mm-hmm, what, yeah. like, there's so many things that you need to consider when booking something like this, but I do also think that you just sit down in a room and hash that out and come up with something, and that is what I'm hoping that they do for Forbidden Door 2. If only resting with that simple. If eh? only. <laughs> if only. But at the very least, I'm shocked that it's even like this low on our list. I I had it higher on mine. I think it's one of the best top-to-bottom wrestling cards of the whole year, just from quality of match performance and whatnot. We've talked a lot about this list and our last one about the importance of work rate and where that lies in terms of how they leave them and the overall impact that it has on someone's viewing experience but i think this is the work rate show of the year and i think that goes a long way for me personally in at number four with 49 points 17 nominations two of which were top level aew revolution I probably would have had this a little bit higher, personally, than number four. I think this is one of the best shows of the year, without a doubt. The caliber of wrestling on this show was top tier. The moments on this show were top tier. William Regal's debut was so good! Oh, it it made you so excited for what's to come. Main event of Hangman and Cole. Jade Cargill. Her outfit for this show was so good! (laughs) Genuinely, one of the things... (laughs) She looks like a superhero. Or a Mortal Kombat character. <laughs> <laughs> Loved Excalibur on that, in that moment. Uh, it's call cool of the year. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's so good. Uh, just so much of this show 
was incredible from top to bottom. You want to talk about matches? I Kings thought, of Jericho. That's what I was say. That. Yeah, matches I would have thought would have been on match of the year, and I think it would have done had they not driven the feud into the yeah. ground. Yes, Kingston Jericho at Revolution. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, it's the best match that those two had of, of the whole series. Absolutely. Outside, Absolutely. outside of the ending of Blood and Guts, which, and again, the only reason that's not my top point of it because they didn't follow up on the Eddie uh, Claudio stuff. Mm -hmm. But the first match that those two had was superb. Mm -hmm. So, so great. Yeah, you want to talk about a card top to bottom, yep. T to B, that is just like flawless, basically? Yeah, that, that the one. Tag, uh, tag three, three way. way. Yeah. Oh. Jurassic Express versus Young Bucks versus Red Dragon. Mm -hmm. One of the most underrated tag matches of the whole year. Like, nobody talks about that match at this point. It was brilliant. Yeah. Was great. Absolutely fantastic. And again, you look at the, the buy-in and you've got the what was supposed to be the end of the House of Black Death Triangle thing, but then Ray Phoenix broke his arm and you had Eric Redbeard instead. Still a fantastic match. So many good matches on this show. You had Punk and MJF, which we talked about in our best matches. Oh, yeah. Punk and MJF. Go about that one. <laughs> With the entrance and the Ring of Honor and the yeah. Wardlow turn and Maybe people didn't get into the ladder match itself as much because there were some wonky bits and some possible injuries and everything, but still a crowning moment for Wardlow when you pair that with the ring moment in the MJF match. There was a lot to like on this show. Mm -hmm. And there's some things that, again, fall a little bit flat. Like, I think a lot of people were really looking for more out of the Britt Baker Thunder Rosa match that was instead just used to set up the big cage match. It's a shame. But... This the cage match that has been on. There. Like I get saving yeah. it for dynamite, but mm -hmm. yeah, you're right. Like they, they were saving a lot because yeah. they knew they were going to be doing it a week later. To me, though, this show is one that is better represented by its highlights than by its misses. Yeah, and there are a lot of highlights on this show. Absolutely, for me, it's the best AEW show of the year, best AEW pay per view of the year, I should say. I don't know, and the reason why I say that is because in joint seconds, mm. the fourth place had 49 points. In joint second, with 81 points, 22 nominations for one, 24 nominations for the other, AEW Full Gear, and WrestleMania 38. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I only say that I, because I, I, I don't know where I stand between Revolution and Full Gear. We'll talk about Full Gear first, because Full Gear for me was like, it was... And I think you're right. I think it is Revolution, but Full Gear has a different emotional reaction to it. Absolutely. Because Full Gear has that like, oh this company needed this show. Yeah. Revolution was like still at that peak of mm -hmm. AEW, like, you know, coming off of All Out last year, Full Gear last year, into Revolution. And it was like, it was just up and up and up and up and up. But they were on such a downward slope that they needed Full Gear. And Full mm -hmm. Gear really ramped the company back up to the point where we kind of, as AEW fans, wanted it to be. And so I think that for me, it is, I voted Full Gear higher than Revolution, but it's only now sort of in hindsight that I think that was a reactionary thing, an emotional response mm -hmm. more than anything else. Which is fine. If you have a, a higher emotional response to this show and you prefer it, good. That, <laughs> that's totally okay. Because Full Gear also had some of my favorite wrestling moments of the year. Absolutely. The, the Elite's Return, the Jamie Hater title mm. win, the MJF title win with the Regal turn and everything. Like there was so much on this show that I absolutely love. The Swerve and Our Glory acclaimed like finishing up that feud and I thought this show, I, the Jungle Boy Luchasaurus Jungle Boy cage was match yeah. was absolutely awesome. Like yeah. this, this show just delivered and delivered and delivered for me. Mm -hmm. And again, like in its in a bit of a running theme, I think Jade Cargill's match was probably the only weak point of the show, arguably. Yeah. You can make the argument. Like to me, I voted for this as my show of the year. I think I think this I, is my show. Of the I year think as well. coming out of it being like. That was the show that AEW needed right now goes a long way. I think that there were so many moments on this show that just filled me with such joy, whether it was the Elite coming back and having an amazing match right off the bat, or the Jungle Boy Luchasaurus cage match that I was really looking forward to, and then it paid off. The ROH title four-way yeah. that had some incredible moments in it was a fantastic match. Samoa Joe winning the TNT title. There was a lot to really, really like on this show. It felt like a lot more of the show that we were getting a year earlier where you just set up this card and you just have great match after great match after great match after great match. And yeah, like there were different things that maybe could have been done a little bit better. I know a lot of people were kind of down on Soraya's match and fair, fair play. Yeah. You know, it wasn't the highlight of the show that a lot of the other bits were, but there was enough on this show 
that really, really hit home how special everyone on it was, how special the company was and can be. And the Jamie Hayter thing, I think, is my biggest highlight of the whole show. Yeah. By a country mile, to me, the best women's match that's been on AEW pay-per-view. A real crowning moment that we haven't had in a long time in the women's division. And just an organic reaction that's being followed up on, which was exactly what we were asking them to do. It's, it's like her and the acclaimed are yeah. like the two acts that Tony Khan is like, okay, well, the fans are behind these, so I'm pushing these guys to the yeah. moon. And, and I think you could definitely make an argument as to whether Full Gear or Revolution is like a, a better show. I think something that helps elevate Full Gear even higher is the fact that AEW had been on that downturn. Yeah. So the expectations for the show were like, uh, I don't know, gang. <laughs> Oh, hey, I'm just getting a bit bad a now. A lot of us going like, I mean, I hope this one's good. I hope though. this yeah. one's back it, to where it, it needs, needs to be. be good. <laughs> They're due. Yeah, because yeah. we've had some bad months here. Yeah, guys. they could just have a good show. And then they went, no, here's an excellent show. And you go, <laughs> yeah. oh, thank God. So I think that helps elevate it in people's minds even more. For me, I prefer Revolution, but there's a, a it's so close between the two. If you say that Full Gear is your favorite show, I'm not going to be like, no, <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> like, it's totally an argument for that. Totally. It was a, it was a fantastic show. So that got 22 nominations, six of which were top level. Mm. Interestingly, WrestleMania, same amount of points, 81, 24 nominations. So two more nominations and eight of those were top level. So wow. two more top levels, but so many more lower mm. nominations in there that they ended up with the same points. And I kind of, same thing with WrestleMania is that as a card, there was a lot on WrestleMania that was like, eh. <laughs> A lot of people were like hugely into the idea of WrestleMania, but a lot of people were into the idea of uh, Cody Rhodes mm. making his return, all the rumors of Steve Austin mm -hmm. making an in-ring return, but people were really down on the winner-takes-all aspect of it, and people kind of had kind of low expectations going into WrestleMania, and I think it's a testament to WWE how good this year's WrestleMania was, because this year's WrestleMania, as a WWE fan, blew away so many expectations to the point where he's like you look back and it's like man i don't think there were like really that many bad matches on there actually i think both nights really there was, there's such a good discussion about like what was the best night was it night one or night two mm. and there's arguments we made on on both sides of it really so, you know there's even things like pat mcafee's match which it led into Pat versus Vince, which is like mm -hmm. one of the most insane things I've ever seen in a wrestling program. Yeah, sure. Probably one of the worst matches of the year, but holy heckins did I have fun. And the Vince sell of the stunner is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Immediately followed by Austin Theory's sell of the stunner. <laughs> was... one, of the, one of the worst things I've ever seen. <laughs> oh, phenomenal work and then uh, pat selling of the stunner oh, and then like drinking God. the beer while he was yeah. knocked out and stuff it is a bonkers wrestlemania it is a sports entertainment show yeah almost from top to bottom i think arguably one of the highest weak points of the show is reigns lesnar which <laughs> not great considering it's your main event and the whole thing that's built around but like some of the highs of wrestlemania are huge and because it's wrestlemania a a mild high feels so much higher mm -hmm. because of the environment surrounding it and the, the gravitas and the, the pomp and circumstance of WrestleMania. So when you have a Bianca Becky, when you have a Sammy versus Johnny Knoxville, when you have Vince McMahon wrestling, ill-advised or not, Steve Austin wrestling, Steve yeah. Austin wrestling, when you have all these things that are great, they feel much better when they're at a WrestleMania. And on that point, Cody Rhodes. Cody yeah. Rhodes debuting, returning. AEW Cody Rhodes. Yeah. Co-founder. Wrestling, wrestling in WWE. It was surreal. Full Cody presentation yeah. as well. This was not like a dashing repack or anything like that. This was American Nightmare, symbol and all. Mm -hmm. With the music. Adrenaline the music. in my soul. He came out. He was AEW's Cody Rhodes. He even had the, the Cody Vader, mm -hmm. which they, they stopped doing because yeah. it kept breaking. And there was like, nah, just walk out normally. Yeah, But it was... One of the most surreal things so surreal. in a year of surreal things. Yeah. Watching AEW's Cody Rhodes come out and wrestle at WrestleMania, in, in many ways, felt like more of a Forbidden Door than the entire card of Forbidden Door did. Mm. I so think awesome. this one's a tough one for me to kind of quantify because it being a double show, I think there's a lot more to analyze here, of course. Mm, of I course. think that there are some very, very big highlights. Like we talked in our matches of the year. There's two matches 
from WrestleMania that made it onto our match of the year list, that mm. being Becky versus Bianca and the Jackass match, both of which are by far and away big highlights of this show, as well as the Cody Seth Rollins match. And to me, the other one is still like every once in a while, I remember that Steve Austin had a main event of WrestleMania match and it was good. In like, 2022. It, it like, was good. And it, it was, was good. It was like. I re- he took a suplex on the floor, and I was like, he's mm. dead. You, you, just killed, <laughs> you just killed Steve Austin. Good job. And he just continued on. They had a great match. Great brawl. Classic Steve Austin. Fantastic. Everything I would ever want out of a Steve Austin return match. The rest of this show, to me, is not very good. To me, at least. Because you've got, like, Shinsuke Nakamura and Rick Boogs against the Usos. Yeah, yeah which that's is just Rick, Rick Boogs tears yeah. his quad, and it was like, it's a thrown-together team anyway. Like, and they came out dressed in uh, merchandise yeah. for, for a, a drink that I don't know. It, like, it, that was odd. You've got the brawling brutes beating the uh, the New Day Oof. right after Big E's injury, yeah, which I choice. still think is the worst booking decision of the whole year. Yeah. And other than like Tyrus winning the NWA title. Stuff, <laughs> whatever. But like things like that, I wasn't as hot on like the whole Vince McMahon wrestling thing. I wasn't watching it in the office here and, and being around people I laughing. Think that, I think that helps a lot. Viewing yeah. experience. Absolutely. Viewing experience goes a long way. I do think that the, I don't remember a single moment of the main event. And you nope. talk about how you leave them. Oh, I, I, can, I can tell you what happened. There were some German suplexes, and uh, a, a Superman punch, a spear, yeah, yeah. yeah. a couple, a couple of kickouts of F fives. Yeah. Yeah, 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 but I don't know. Like I think what you said goes a long way here, where you almost get bonus points if you have big, emotional, great moments at WrestleMania. Mm-hmm. And fair play to that. You get some of my favorite moments of the whole year are like Bianca's entrance at WrestleMania this year. Because I was like, there's a star. Mm-hmm. There's the biggest star that I've seen on this show right now. Just coming out with the huge, elaborate WrestleMania entrance. And you can only do that at WrestleMania. Mm-hmm. You can only do that all the way at WrestleMania. So there are a number of things that I think do elevate it up. I was on my list, I'm pretty sure, of five shows to be on this list. But tied for second, it surprises me a little bit. But I think it does also just go to show not a lot of people had high hopes for this WrestleMania. And it surpassed those high hopes a lot. Well, the surprising thing for me, <coughs> this was number one mm. for a long time in the poll. This and Full Gear were mm. both like really battling out for number one. However, in at number one with 97 points, well, yeah, 27 nominations. Yeah. I mean, you say, oh yeah, Pete. Incredibly biased. 11 of those were top level, but eight of those nominations were well, eight of the last... 10 nominations for this show were top level nominations. Mm-hmm. This yeah. was middle of the pack until the final eight nominations came in. Clash at the Castle mm-hmm. with 97 points. That was my number one. Oh, yeah. show of the I year. It was either this or Full Gear, but for sure. Yeah. This is my number one. This was, this was I think this was my number four because I had Full Gear at, at number one, but mm. it really was a toss up for me between two of them. And again, I don't know whether it. I, I, you know what? It's not viewing experience. Because there's not a bad thing on this show. This is a great show. This is a great, great show. It was yeah. Triple H putting on an NXT card. Yep. There's <laughs> six matches on this show. Mm. And it was all six matches got their time. Mm-hmm. All six matches got their moments. All six matches delivered on what they set We're out to do. Different. All mm. different as well. Like it is, it's the great. Uh, when, here's the thing like with Clash of the Castle. When WWE announced they were doing a pay per view in the UK, we did not rush out to buy tickets because at that point it wasn't a great product and we weren't really that bothered. And we also had it in our mind. We were going to do a live show anyway. We were going to do it as a a live watch along party at a pub. So we kind of already had that in mind. So we kind of like resigned ourselves to be like, well, it doesn't matter that we can't get tickets or we're not going to get tickets for it because we're going to do the live show anyway. That's actually what we want to do. But when I was watching the show, Despite how great of a viewing experience it was, there was that time it's like, man, if they do another show in the UK, I might want to go to that mm-hmm. because holy hell, this show was so, so good. Mm-hmm. That main event ruled. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The emotion of that main event. Dominic Mysterio kicking oh. his dad ruled. Hit your dad. Hit your dad. Every single... Like, Seamus Gunther mm-hmm. was awesome. I... Loved, loved, loved this pay-per-view. 
I was so surprised it wasn't doing that well in the nominations. Like it was doing well, mm -hmm. but it's, as I said, eight of the last 10 nominations were the five points, all top level. And that is what pushed it into the number one spot with 97 points. But it was, yeah, like third or fourth for a long, long time. Right? I thought it was hands down going to be WrestleMania of full gear until those last nominations came in. I think if you asked people who didn't work at WrestleTalk or who weren't $100 patron backers to WrestleTalk who probably made the trip to the watch party, uh, probably wouldn't have been number one. But I think a lot of us just go, well, Clash of the Castle was number one because we had the watch pie and it was amazing. A lot of us have said, what a great night that was for us to, to be among people who enjoy us and who enjoy the show that we were watching. We were on the high of Triple H taking over. To have that environment that we haven't had before, to host the watch party, to be in that environment, to have the rotating cast of doing the live stream, to have Tempest defending the Jam in the Championship, unless, you know, you have your cashing in your Jam in the Jar, like, all of this circumstance surrounding it made it the viewing experience, as we keep saying, the best viewing experience that I've ever had watching a wrestling show. Hands down. I can't compare it to anything else that I've ever watched that elevates it to already like a four-star show. And then you have an incredible show and it just elevates it to make it even better. It's the best live wrestling show I've ever watched. Ever. Hands down. To that point, our partners were there. Yes. You know, watching it with us. Yeah. And they're not wrestling fans. Mm -mm. My sister-in-law was there at the show and this was like her first ever, ever time watching wrestling. She had so much fun. Mm. She's not a wrestling fan now. She's not like watched more shows afterwards, but she had so much fun at Clash of the Castle because she got it and she got into it and she enjoyed the spectacle of what was on screen and what was happening with our audience, what was happening with the audience that was at the events live mm. in Cardiff. And I think that really shows how much of a show this was, how great of a show Clash of the Castle was. It was fantastic. Yeah. It, to me perfectly exemplified and there's been a little bit of this from time to time on the triple h shows that have come since then but this to me was the best example of like no they're taking the nxt takeover style and applying it to the main roster absolutely and I was like, i'm yeah. so excited for the future of wwe big shows if that is going to be the case where you only have a handful of matches they're all given time and i cannot stress enough how important it is that they're all different there were not two matches on this show, whether it's the Judgment Day match with Edge and Mysterio or it's the Riddle and Seth Rollins match that was also great. The main event, you had this, the Gunther and, and Sheamus match. You had Liv Morgan and Shayna Baszler. You it's had the only down point of the match. And even as down as the short. best <laughs> the best match of Liv Morgan's uh, yeah, title reign. It, every single thing on the show was unique. And gave you that new energy every time you saw what was coming up next. And you still had the moments on this show, whether it was Giovanni Vinci coming out, or whether it was Solo Sokoa's debut, or whatever it may be. There were so many good moments on this show. And yes, we are biased because we had a very unique special viewing experience. But I, I think this was still by far the best WWE show of the year. It has, again, maybe the best WWE match of all time on it. And that is going to raise up any show that has that on it up considerably from where it would have been. Yeah. It was just such a good, good show. And maybe it was maybe it was your number one show of the year. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was Full Gear, Revolution, or Forbidden Door. Whatever. Maybe it was WrestleMania. A lot of people seem to like WrestleMania. This was such an excellent show to really give people that goodwill feeling towards Triple H. 100%. Mm -hmm. And to add as well, like, you know, people might say it's a biased thing because we had such a good fun time at the watch party and stuff. And I, I think you're right. Like, I think even taking that out, this was a great show regardless. Mm -hmm. Of those eight, of those 10 nominations, the last ones, very few of those are us. Mm -hmm. Those are a lot of the, are the influence that are going around. And a lot of those were our $100 backers coming in. So maybe some of them were there for the show. Maybe some of them weren't. But like, this isn't just us. Mm. It's just us that loved Clash of the Castle or people that came to our watch long party. This top to bottom, I think, is just the most praised show that WWE has had this year. And it's the first of the Triple H era that was the real Triple H era yeah. because SummerSlam wasn't a card that he'd booked. This one was. And it, it told you everything you needed to know about what to expect from Triple H pay-per-views moving forward. And that, for me, 
chef's kiss perfect and it had the best ending of a pay-per-view all year of course <laughs> <laughs> that's how good this show is yeah. <laughs> that no one talks about the bad karaoke Every- everyone has said what a good show we'll just pretend that bit doesn't exist we all have yeah. we've, we've all, all decided gone, no. it didn't happen yeah. that the show feed did cut yes yeah. uh, on the on the that shot of the bloodline standing there we were like mm-hmm. yep cool that's, that's the shot it's Roman and it's so- and Solo that's how the show goes off the air not Tyson Fury and Drew badly singing Don't Look Back in Anger by Ooh. Oasis Ooh. you know in Manchester like at least sing the Manic Street Preachers <laughs> <laughs> is Drew McIntyre's favourite band yeah, well, yeah, maybe. Drew McIntyre's home country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they also tried that with Seamus. Uh, <laughs> yeah. They're from Great Britain. Yeah. People from Wales love it when we do this bit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It also led to a lot of conversation I had about the M4. And <laughs> people outside of the US loved it when I wouldn't shut up about the M4 motorway. <laughs> various different service stations you can go to Mm -hmm. but there we have it those are our top 10 pay-per-views of 2022 let us know what you think of them leave a comment down below what was your show of the year now if you've made it this far and it's your first time here and you haven't already press that subscribe button give us a little thumbs up as well we have got more award shows because coming up next week it's time to reveal the worst matches of the year and the worst pay-per-views of the year as well so be an interesting show that one maybe get in some of your predictions down below what you think is going to appear on those awards but until then i have been luke owen dad that has been chop Quinnell. that has been tempest jam that jam <laughs>